Can everyone see that? Yes. Okay. Um, put this right here. Okay. Um, here we go. Uh, so today's uh, didactic is on heart failure in the lung. And, and the reason why I um, created this lecture is because uh, in this, my new position, um, I just uh, recognized I was seeing just a whole lot of cardiovascular disease something that was uh, incrementally quite a bit greater than my prior institution in Kentucky. And so I thought it might be useful to, to talk about this a little bit and um, show clinicians uh, some of the things that I've been seeing and maybe it will be helpful to you. So the objectives today are just three. We'll identify clinical imaging and functional features of lung disease due to heart failure. We'll recognize mimickers of heart failure and uh, just a few words about therapy. So here's some basic heart failure statistics. It's estimated that about 2% of the adult population in developed countries have heart failure. Uh, we don't know the, the data from undeveloped countries, but I imagine it's about the same. So one in 50 people have heart failure, pretty impressive numbers there. Uh, for prevalence, I would say that, you know, the reduced ejection fraction heart failure is about the same as preserved ejection heart failure. And that's something that's been recognized over the past say 30 to 40 years. And heart failure has a bad prognosis. About 30 to 40% die within the first year of diagnosis and 60 to 70% die within five years. This is like very bad cancer. And the prognosis also varies with the severity and that's uh, reflected in the New York Heart Association classification scheme. Class two patients, which is the mildest symptomatic patient has a five to 10% annual mortality rate, but that goes up quite a bit. If you have the worst class, which is class four, which means you have symptoms of dyspnea and shortness of, shortness of breath and uh, fatigue at rest. So just to round this thought out a little bit, because we're gonna be talking about the heart, uh, you know, manifesting as lung problems. Uh, I think turnabout is fair play. And this is from a paper in the Blue Journal from last month. And basically lung disease of a severity that is significant, and here we're talking about emphysema, can actually impair heart function. So I'm not gonna say any more about that, but again, it works opposite from the heart causing lung problems. So a little bit of pathophysiology of heart failure, and I try not to belabor this too much. Uh, this is a graph uh, with pressure on the y-axis, uh, volume on the x-axis, and so this would be an elastance curve. And I'm gonna go, um, I think, well, I can't, it doesn't work here. Uh, so I'm gonna use my uh, cursor then. Uh, so at this point here, at the bottom, um, where the yellow line, dotted yellow line starts, is where the mitral valve would open, and this would be diastolic filling as we go you know, across the bottom here. Uh, stalk, systole starts here, it's isovolumetric contraction here at this point, which I'm circling is where the mitral valve, excuse me, the aortic valve would open, you'd eject blood to this point here, and then the aortic valve would close, you'd relax and you'd repeat. So that's a one cycle of the left ventricle. Now, at the bottom between these two points would be your stroke volume, which is very important for cardiac output, which is stroke volume times heart rate. I'll uh, just show you these three other lines, which are very important. So this first dotted red line is the in systolic pressure volume relationship. It's basically a reflection of contractility or how well the ventricle squeezes. That's what that, that line reflects there, the higher or the the higher the uh, slope, the better it squeezes. So if it would go up, that would be even better. This blue dotted line is arterial elastance. And basically that's just a reflection of this uh, arterial afterload. Um, and that's the pressure against which the ventricle must work. So we don't want that to be too great. Notice that those two points join and that's where the basically marks where the aortic valve closes in the end of systole. So that's a very important point. The yellow dotted line is reflects preload, and that's the end diastolic pressure volume relationship, and that reflects preload. So those three points in, 
line, through those three lines uh, in point, let's just take a look here. So in a heart failure where you have a reduced ejection fraction, you could imagine that your in systolic pressure volume relation is depressed. So it goes down because maybe you've lost some heart muscle. And so you can't pump as strongly as you used to. So you, nothing else has changed at this moment. You just can't pump as well. So notice that that juncture of the arterial elastance, which at this point is not changed, goes down. And what that gives you is, let's see, a reduced stroke volume. Because your stroke volume is between these two points, now your stroke volume is depressed. And that would be one manifestation of heart failure, a low cardiac output because you have a low stroke volume. So how do you compensate? Well, you compensate down here along your uh, in diastolic pressure volume relationship. You move up that, you retain water and sodium. You, you, you get a larger venous return, larger blood volume. And then because you've done that, voila, your stroke volume is preserved. It's about the same as it was before, but it's done at a cost. And the cost is here, the pressure within your pulmonary capillary bed, which is transmitted from left atrium to the pulmonary vein to pulmonary capillary bed, that pressure goes up. And so you're gonna be working at a higher pressure, which will lead to pulmonary edema and ultimately to systemic edema. So that's the cost of preserving that stroke volume by retaining fluid. And you'll see that fluid in, is uh, edema of the legs and rowels or pulmonary auscultation of the heart and lungs. Now, that's just if you everything else remains normal. Now, the situation where you have diastolic dysfunction or heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, that yellow line changes. And there, I've just popped it in. That yellow line is now much uh, shorter and more steeper in its, um, in its trajectory. And what that does now is something also that, again, half the patients with heart failure have uh, diastolic or preserved ejection fraction heart failure. Uh, and so what happens there? Well, if the line is there, our stroke volume is again is decreased. And so patients with uh, stiff hearts, diastolic dysfunction, generate poor stroke volume despite the fact that they squeeze normally. It's problems that they fill abnormally. And so that's very briefly a pathophysiology of heart failure, both systolic and diastolic dys dysfunction and why they have edema. So clinically, uh, diagnosing heart failure, there are tr traditional uh, historical and physical exam findings that we look at. And these, this table on the right is derived from two papers. They're quite old now. And these were looking at a large group of patients with chronic heart failure due to coronary artery disease, sensitivity and specificity in these tables. So the, in, in large measure, the sensitivity is not perfect for heart failure diagnosis. So it's been reported somewhere between 50 to 73% in specificity, about the same. Um, and if you look at that table, the most sensitive uh, item on it is exertional dyspnea, but it's only two thirds of the patients with chronic heart failure due to coronary disease have it, probably some, because some of those are well managed with medication, diet, et cetera. But when you look further down the table, the sensitivities of these other uh, features like orthopnea, having to prop yourself up to sleep at night, uh, his reporting edema, these are not very good. Okay, this is sensitivity. Uh, on the specificity side, you'll note that some of these things that are not very sensitive are quite specific. So it's valuable to do a history and examination. And when you find these features, the specificity or, or indicating disease is pretty darn good. But if you're screening, not so great. Um, so, to, and I'll make one point I'll come back to a little bit later is Nocturnal symptomatology, in other words, classically wheezing and shortness of breath, cough at nighttime with, with recumbency, which usually can reflect paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea here on this table. You know, having to wake up in the middle of the night, shorter breath, having to sit on the side of the bed, that may mimic asthma. Asthmatics have very similar symptomatology, and often because of circadian rhythms, those symptoms come more severely at nighttime. I'll bring that up. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. Just keep that in mind. But the sensitivity and specificity of clinical criteria for the diagnosis of heart failure is not great. And so one of the major advances or moves forward was the uh, natriuretic peptide analysis that we've done for a couple of decades now. 
The best one probably is the NT Pro in BNP, and that has a 90% sensitivity for the diagnosis of acute heart failure, which as you can see is a significant advance. Um, it's uncommonly falsely negative, but one situation where it can be is in patients with obesity is something to think about. Now it's very sensitive, but it's not that specific as you might imagine. Uh, and it can be elevated in a number of non-cardiac conditions. And we'd call this a risk for a false positive. And so with advancing age, the normal range goes up. Uh, patients with renal failure, anemia, uh, patients with critical illness, bacterial sepsis, systemic burns, pneumonia, pulmonary hypertension, all these are reasons for an elevated BNP. So if you have an elevated BNP, someone who's suspected heart failure, you are not done with your diagnosis. It just mainly supports the idea you could. You have to go, on, go further with your diagnostic workup. Um, and again, just to point out that the rule in for acute heart failure, uh, the normal increases with age. So there are different cut points. I have not included them here, but you can see them um, on the internet if you wish. The rule outs for acute and chronic heart failure are somewhat different, but I'll move on from that. That's just heart failure clinical diagnosis. And to round out the, these thoughts about evaluation, physiology, and workup, um, I want to point out that heart failure is a syndrome. It's not a diagnosis. So lots of different things may cause heart failure as the final common pathway. Uh, ischemic heart disease, which is the most common, you know, coronary artery disease, coronary occlusion, myocardial infarction, all those would be grouped under ischemia. But valvular heart disease, mitral valve, aortic valve disease can cause heart failure with normal muscle. Myocarditis has, sometimes has been happened with COVID. It's happened with COVID vaccination, post-infectious. Uh, genetic diseases may account for a third of patients of heart failure they've been finding out. This is a fairly new information. Infiltrated diseases that are systemic, like sarcoidosis and amyloidosis, can do this. The only point here is that it's a heart failure is a syndrome. You still have to make a specific diagnosis or at least try to. So here's the other things you can do in a heart failure workup. We talked about natriuretic peptides. I think almost everyone would agree that a patient that has heart failure or suspected heart failure should have this test. A chest X-ray, it's the best rule in test. The natriuretic peptides would be perhaps the best rule out test for heart failure because they have the highest sensitivity. But chest X-ray is probably the best rule in test, but you need to know that 20% will have no normal or no obvious findings for heart failure. Uh, you should check your hemoglobin level because iron deficiency anemia is not rare in chronic heart failure and treating that can lead to significant improvements in symptoms. Renal function is very important for therapeutic choices. And lastly, you need to perform an echocardiogram. And this is to assess LV ejection fraction, but also wall motion abnormalities, the valves, how the myocardium appears, right heart function, and pericardium, et cetera. So now we're gonna move on to what the talk's really about with that background, the lungs in the setting of heart disease. And so the first one here we're gonna talk about, is there any data on the lung function? on lung function heart failure? Well, there's not really that much actually. Uh, this is a paper, uh, this table was derived from, looking at the FEV1, FEC, diffusion capacity, DLCO, total lung capacity and residual volume in patients that had mitral valve disease severe enough to be sent to surgery, and that's pretty severe. And it's an older paper, 40 year, almost 40 years old. So the, what these patients have is a mixed restrictive and obstructive impairment. And as you can see, these patients uh, but preoperatively had uh, these functions of the FEV1 and FEC by spirometry in the 70% range where 100% would be normal. The diffusion capacity is also reduced. So it's restrictive. So we would call that spirometry restrictive appearing. And that's because the compliance uh, or the stiffness of the lung is increased because lung water, because they have uh, edema of the lungs over time, has developed and it makes the lungs more difficult to expand. We would call that a restrictive impairment. And they can also have pleural effusions. However, when you look down at the total lung capacity is actually slightly above normal and the residual volume that air, lung that stays in the lung afterwards is also significantly elevated. And we would say those are obstructive impairments. And that's probably because uh, the edema also collects around the airways and shrinks or reduces the cross-sectional area of the airways and uh, that leads to obstruction. As I said before, 
um, these patients can sometimes mimic patients with asthma. We, one of the features of asthma is bronchial hyperreactivity or twitchiness of the airways. They, they twitch uh, more so than a normal person would from any kind of stimulus. Uh, and that is pretty common in heart failure. I'm gonna show you this paper on the next slide. So here's a paper, again, it's an older, older paper, but it shows something that I think pay, people, physicians have really forgotten about, I think, um, is that patients with chronic heart failure can mimic asthma. And so this is bronchial hyperresponsiveness in 21 patients of the 23 they studied. And this is a saline, uh, and this is methacholine, which induces bronchial hyperactivity. FEB1 is a percent predicted on the y-axis and showing that a significant degree, 21 out of 23 patients had hyper-responsiveness to this um, methacholine, which is usually given to diagnose asthma. So these patients are functioning very much like asthma, and the range of this uh, drop is really very suggestive of asthma. So the point here is when you're thinking about patients with heart failure or thinking about patients with asthma, you at least need to pass through your mind, could this person have heart failure is presenting as asthma or perhaps vice versa. It's something to think about. So we're gonna now look at chest radiography of heart failure. And because it really, not only does it help you diagnose the case, it also uh, supports the pathophysiology, your understanding. So there are four features I'd like to point out. Bronchial cuffing, bilateral pleural effusions, curly B lines, which Curly was a radiologist. So the, some people would call these septal lines and then alveolar edema. So let's first look at this one. So this is bronchial cuffing. And what that means is that the airway wall is thickened. So I'm gonna show you this x-ray inside the yellow circle. There are two things I'm pointing to. One is the solid little rounded area on both of these x-rays. That's the pulmonary artery branch. And right next to it is the circle with the dark center. And that's the bronchus. And that's the uh, circular, that circle around it is the bronchial wall. And that bronchial wall will become thickened uh, in a number of conditions, but certainly in heart failure with pulmonary edema. And that will encroach on the lumen. Notice that this is October 1 here, before when they came into the hospital. And here's October 14 after they've been diuresed and had liters of fluid come off their body, basically. Notice that the airway wall, that thickness of that line is now less. That's showing you that the bronchial cuffing got better. I'll show you this a little bit more in a second. Bilateral pleural effusions or fluid within the pleural space that's outside of the lung, but inside of the chest, that happens as well in the proper context, that's highly suggestive of heart failure. Again, they should be mostly bilateral effusions and freely layering. Show you more about that in a second. Curly B lines. Now, this is harder to see, I'm gonna tell you. See these uh, straight lines here, they're going to the pleural surface. Those are called curly lines or septal lines. Again, more about that in a moment. And then alveolar edema, just basically this chest X-ray was should be black, the lungs are now becoming diffusely white. And that's the most severe manifestation of heart failure. But any of these four, and usually they come together, is highly suggestive in the proper clinical context of heart failure. So let's talk about that first one, bronchial cuffing. This is a diagram taken from Fraser and Perez, uh, diseases of the chest. This is sort of the Bible of chest radiology. And so here, normally at the top of the diagram, the BR is for bronchus, the PA is for pulmonary artery. They divide and run together in the lung. The interstitium is normally just this very thin space in black and in the hatched marks around those two structures, which are the lumen of which is about the same size bronchus and pulmonary artery. With edema, that edema fluid, not only in the lungs, but also in the interstitium forms around the pulmonary artery and the bronchus. Now, the pulmonary artery, you don't notice the difference on a plain x-ray because uh, inside is blood, which is radio-opaque, and outside is radio-opaque. But in the bronchus, you do notice the difference. Um, and again, showing you that same image I just showed you before because the air inside you see, and you can see that difference, that thickness of that bronchial wall, and that's what's causing it, is that interstitial edema. And here on a CT scan, you see it even better. So as a two views from the same patient, 
you can see that that bronchus is thick and then you can see that's a cross section of the bronchus and then you can see it end on if or excuse me if you can see it uh, tangentially you can see how that airway wall is thick and everywhere you look you start to see the same thing here it's very thick and that's all from uh, edema in the interstitium and you can quite imagine I think if you think about it how that edema would encroach on the lumen or the area of, of the airway and cause obstruction of airflow. And you can see why maybe that could mimic, for instance, asthma, which also has bronchial wall thickening, but it's not from edema, it's from uh, inflammation from asthma, but not to get too far into that, but just reasons. We're just talking about reasons and pathophysiology here. Let's move on to plural, plural fluid formation and handling without getting too much into it. Uh, you're always making pleural fluid in your body and you're always draining it away. But because you don't have a high pressure in your pulmonary vasculature, because you're not, I hope I, everyone in the audience is, is not in heart failure at this moment. So you have no pleural fluid that's uh, uh, really much there at all. So you don't have that problem. Um, you have a visceral and a parietal pleura. And, but when you go into heart failure, because you have high pressure within the pulmonary capillaries, you uh, transudate a large amount of fluid into your lung and your and ultimately it will it can overwhelm your drainage capacity and so you drain that fluid out in the parietal pleura which is this electron micrograph here this little hole is meant to represent that in the diagram same thing uh, in two different ways and that's how you drain that fluid out of there and keep your pleural flu, pleural space dry so you don't have pleural effusions however in heart failure you tend to overwhelm that and you can develop pleural fluid there and it's not uncommon at all. Uh, normally the lymphatic drainage, which I showed you with that uh, EM and that diagram, it can absorb 30 X greater than formation. So you can put a lot of fluid in there, your body can take care of it. However, there's limits for everything. And so ultimately if your heart failure is bad enough, you can develop pleural effusions. And here you can see this X-ray in the middle. You can see this patient has you know, fluid as, as evidenced by this meniscus, this curve is linear finding here. This would be pretty common in a patient with heart failure. Typically, you have bilateral effusions. It may not be quite so evident on the left, and that's pretty typical also. Um, like at least 85 90% of patients that have uh, heart failure effusion have bilateral effusion, but right side is often greater than left. Uh, and there's Light's criteria. Richard Light was a physician who pioneered this work. The point I'm going to tell you here, just the take homes, is that uh, heart failure effusions tend to be bilateral. Um, maybe right is slightly greater than left, but what are they not? They're not unilateral, like this picture over here. Not unilateral, especially not unilateral left, and especially not massive, like you see here. So if you look at these two x ray cases, the one on the left, the one my cursor is over, um, this will be pretty typical of heart failure. You have edema, you probably have septal lines if you look closely, um, and you have bilateral small effusions. The other side, you have a, a fairly clear looking right lung, a massive effusion shifting, and this was cancer, okay, different things. Now, um, when you treat patients with heart failure, a lot of times physicians will ask, you know, me as a pulmonary consultant, should we do a drainage procedure on patients? Occasionally that might be, uh, in, indicated if a patient has a very large effusion, which would be unusual for heart failure. But, you know, sometimes there are exceptions to every rule. But I would just point out that 90% or so will resolve within a couple of weeks with proper therapy. And this, there's not much data on this, but this is a paper from the American Heart Journal that looked at this. So do you have to tap these patients? No, you don't. You don't have to form, form thoracentesis. Now, when you do, um, the improvement you get is variable. And so Again, there's this one paper, and this is actually from Richard Light himself, um, showed that for whatever fluid you remove on average, it's highly variable what you get. You get about 23% uh, improvement in your vital capacity for every um, amount of fluid you take off. So, you know, something to think about. But again, if you're, you're pretty sure about the diagnosis and you're treating them, uh, you probably don't need to tap every patient with uh, pleural fluid due to heart failure. So we're going to talk a little bit about chest imaging, some more, I guess, about chest imaging, and uh, just the correlation from the wedge pressure to the chest x-ray. Uh, this is the normal chest x-ray here on the left. 
showing you the vasculature and the size of the vessels. Here in the middle is uh, what we would call the first step in heart failure. It's called cephalization of flow. And what you can see is these superior vessels as denoted by the blue arrows are congested because there's increased amount of blood volume in the heart because the patient's in the early stages of heart failure. Um, this uh, double arrow is called the vascular pedicle. It's something you can see on a, a regular chest X-ray and notice how it's bigger, again, manifesting greater volume of blood within the thorax. And then the heart itself is larger as the double green arrow shows you compared to the normal on the left. So that's the first step. And that's when your pulmonary wedge pressure is elevated somewhere between 13 and 18 millimeters of mercury. Normal would be five to 10. Uh, this is just showing you the most uh, prominent example of cephalization I could find, a patient that I took care of a while back with both heart failure and renal failure. And you can see these are huge superior vessels. Let's go to the next step. And that's where we get into a wedge pressure of say 18 to 25, where we again go to our interstitial or septal lines or our curly B lines, what we talked about before. Again, I've showed this uh, image to medical students for generations. Uh, and they always say, that's the best example you can get. And I say, yeah, that's about as good as it gets on a chest X-ray, but here's a CT scan. And I think you'll be able to appreciate these lines on the CT scan much better. So these are septal lines and they're actually the septal lines are really the lymphatics. Again, we talked about lymphatics and edema. These are the lymphatics that have become dilated uh, because increased lung edema, they're taking, they're distended in the normal structures of the lung, but you just see them better. I would also call your attention to the fact that there is a diffuse haziness here and here, and this is the edema itself in the lung parenchyma. So these would be classic findings of interstitial lung edema from heart failure. And here's your alveolar edema, an image I've already shown you. Um, and this shows a pulmonary wedge pressure of greater than 25 fluffy opacities bilaterally. This is the most severe variant. And you better do something for this patient or they're not going to live that much longer because this is severe. This will kill them. Let's go on. So I'm going to show you a few interesting cases and a few mimickers. So here's a patient I took care of some uh, maybe a year ago. A 68-year-old woman had diabetes, hypertension, atrial fibrillation. She was admitted with dyspnea, leg edema, abdominal distension, weight gain. All these would be could be classic findings or suggestive findings of heart failure. Her lab or renal function was really about normal. Her BNP or natriuretic peptide was elevated. Her venous blood gas showed that she was retaining carbon dioxide with a pH of 7.27 and PCO, CO2 of 89. Usually we think of that kind of CO2 retention as being indicative of severe uh, emphysema or COPD. Um, she had an echocardiogram, her LV size, thickness, and function were noted to be normal with an injection fraction of 55 to 60%, but she had had a right heart catheterization, and these numbers are very high. Pulmonary artery pressure is 83 over 41. It should be uh, no more than, say, 25 over 10. Her pulmonary capillary reg pressure is 36. Remember, we were just talking about normals 5 to 10. Right atrial pressure is 33, normals 1 to 5. I mean, so all these pressures are markedly elevated, despite the fact that her echocardiogram, if you just read this and take it on face value, it's normal. This x-ray, again, has some edema, bilateral effusions, I think. They're small. So here's the same patient. So we got a CT scan before her diuresis. This is April 23rd. And, I'm, and this is the mediastinal windowing, and this is the uh, lung windowing. Same scan, same you know, set of images. Um, here's your bilateral small pleural effusions at the bases. And then May 2nd, same patient, same uh, repeat set of images showing you the re resolution of the pleural effusions at the bottom. And then this patient, even after all this time in the hospital with IV diuresis, she's better for sure. But notice that she still has edema. There is still a haziness to these lungs, which is probably interstitial edema. She's so edematous. I'll show you something else. So look at this. These areas here are lymphadenopathy. These are large lymph nodes within the thorax that is adjacent to the aorta. The aorta is this structure here with this calcification within it. And these have shrunk 
from April 23rd to May 2nd. So we're talking about 10 days or so. Uh, shrunken remarkably just with diuresis, as have total effusions went away, like we talked about. The edema is still present, but much better. But this patient had lymph nodes that were actually, if you looked at these lymph nodes without any of the other findings, you might have worried the patient could have cancer. But these have shrunken remarkably. Which brings me to a few case caveats. So one is, and this is for uh, younger clinicians or clinicians who don't see too many of these patients anymore, thoracic lymph node enlargement, which we define as a short axis or the smaller side of the lymph node being greater than one centimeter, it's actually common in setting a heart failure. And this is something that not a lot of people know, I don't think, or at least recognize. Uh, usually it's diffuse adenopathy involving the right paratracheal and precranial stations. Uh, usually this kind of enlargement is not just a single station and certainly not an isolated high load lymph node. Something to think about though, uh, enlarged lymph nodes in the setting of someone in florid heart failure, like this patient, does not require a workup until you've actually taken care of them and diuresed them. They persist and you might think about it, but it's not in and of itself meaning that the patient has cancer or some awful systemic disease other than heart failure, which is kind of an awful disease, I guess you could say. Um, so another point, value of echocardiography. Now this patient I just showed you had essentially a normal echocardiogram. So here's the thing, I'll just let you know. Um, a lot of cardiologists aren't uh, tuned into uh, the entity of diastolic dysfunction as they are into systolic dysfunction. It's not that they don't know it, it's just that I think there's a sort of a nihilism to it because all the medications and treatments we have for heart failure that result in a better longevity and outcomes, almost all of them relate to systolic dysfunction, not diastolic dysfunction. So it seems, you know, not a lot of options. So people don't pay quite as much attention to it. Some cardiologists are really good at calling and some don't pay it as much attention. This would be a case of the latter. Um, and so the traditional indices of diastolic function may be normal in many patients. And this is a paper from uh, Heart Failure Reviews, which is published this year, actually. Uh, but there are newer indices. And if you have your cardiologist should, you know, is interested in this, there, there are things that they can look at to get better. Um, but anyway, just keep that in mind. Just an echocardiogram, you know, if it shows you the systolic function is normal, it doesn't mean they couldn't have heart failure. Uh, carbon dioxide retention, as in the patient I showed you, had a high PCO2 and a low pH, looks like a patient with severe emphysema or severe asthma and exacerbation. Um, note that, you know, these older studies, which I've noted here back in the 1970s, showed that about 25% of patients who had cardiogenic edema or severe heart failure also had respiratory acidosis. It wasn't clearly related to underlying airflow obstruction, such as you might have with COPD or asthma, or actually clearly related to edema severity. Again, something you should think about. It doesn't mean you have to rush into uh, tagging them with the diagnosis of COPD or asthma. They might have both conditions. They're both common. But just think about that. That is not rare at all, as, as was seen in this case. So, Here's another interesting imaging case, uh, unilateral edema. Now we, we talked about most cases of patients with heart failure of bilateral findings, you know, the bilateral edema, bilateral curly B lines, all that stuff. Well, occasionally, I should, may, maybe I should say rarely, um, severe mitral regurgitation can cause um, these findings. And it's probably because they have a functional obstruction of the right pulmonary vein, or they've been lying on one side for a long time. Anyway, it's been reported, but pretty rare. This is a patient uh, that was reported this year in the Cleveland Clinic Journal of Medicine, showing you uh, the original film is in the middle, showing you this unilateral airspace opacity, which on CT scan is, uh, again, a diffuse haziness, which we call ground glass change, and a small layering pleural effusion on this side. The left side, which is over here, was normal. And, but, you know, they died. They were smart, actually. They thought about the case and I did a good evaluation and they diagnosed the patient with unilateral edema, not pneumonia, which you might thought they would have tagged them with in a COVID patient. And th three days of diuresis later, you can see that the infiltrates have remarkably improved and the oxygenation remarkably improved. They did not give the patient antibiotics. So this was unilateral edema, rare but seen. It's, there we go. Another thing I'd like to bring up uh, sometimes we see in, in the pulmonary world is 
hemoptysis and heart failure. So you have a patient with a history of uh, congestive heart failure and they cough up some blood. And someone says, well, they could have just pulmonary edema from heart failure. Okay, that does happen. So let's, let's look at what that looks like. So this is a patient on a ventilator with frothy pink to red edema fluid. And that's what it, that frothy fluid looks like. Now, if the patient's having this kind of frothy edema fluid, we are looking at a chest x-ray that looks like this. And this is, again, a case of severe alveolar edema. See this, these uh, opacities here within the heart. It's not subtle, in other words. The, this is not a subtle thing. When someone goes into florid pulmonary edema, they're usually on a ventilator. Here's the endotracheal tube in their trachea. And here it is uh, in the picture. So this patient's severely ill from heart failure. So acute to compensate severe heart failure. Uh, patients that just have normal, clear chest x-ray in a history of heart failure and coughing up blood, I wouldn't go and just say, oh, that's a patient with, that's just due to the heart failure. You might be missing cancer or something else severe. So I wouldn't immediately attribute that to heart failure. Now, mitral stenosis is a special case. Thankfully, mitral stenosis is nowhere near as common as it used to be because of antibiotics and uh, medical care, but it still happens. Um, and I've seen a number of cases here in West Virginia since over the past two years. So in mitral stenosis, you have long-standing high left atrial pressure. And over time, and we're talking about decades typically, uh, they can produce these high pressure vessels within the airways of the lung, um, which can mimic uh, the pathophysiology of a pulmonary vein stenosis after left atrial ablation. Um, now, Here's a bronchoscopic uh, visualization of the airway. And you see these vessels, these branching structures here are large vessels, these varices I refer to here. These varices under very high pressure. And when they bleed, they don't actually have to have this edema fluid like here. They bleed, it's just pure blood. It's not this frothy pink stuff. They bleed, and I've seen this uh, on a number of occasions, it's pretty darn scary. Um, and I point this out for young uh, clinicians who might be doing bronchoscopies that if you see something like this, uh, don't touch it with the bronchoscope and certainly never biopsy it or you're going to have a bad day and so will the patient. So two different kinds of hemopsis and heart failure. This one from just alveolar edema and this one where you have these varices. Now, um, in mitral stenosis especially, over time they're bleeding little by little in their lungs and then because they do this over decades, they can deposit iron from the blood in their lung parenchyma, and we call that hemosiderosis. Again, uncommon, does happen. And over time, that can actually calcify. You can get these opacities here. So mitral stenosis is a special case for a lot of different things, but just keep this in mind. So we're going to talk about some radiographic mimics of heart failure. So we've talked about interstitial edema. We've talked about, I showed you some pictures of ground glass opacification, which is that haziness I, I referred to. Septal line thickening, also curly lines, and bronchial wall thickening, we call bronchial cuffing. I'm gonna show you mimickers of each. So here's the amiodarone toxicity. Amiodarone, amiodarone is commonly used drug in patients with advanced heart failure. Uh, it has both, but it has both direct toxicity and immunologic mechanisms. And there's this dose-related toxicity. If you take 400 milligrams a day for more than two months or 200 milligrams for more than two years, you can develop interstitial edema and ultimately interstitial fibrosis from this. Um, and it's sometimes difficult to tease out by uh, physical examination, history, and uh, chest x-ray because they're developing interstitial fibrosis. They'll have crackles, just like a heart failure patient would. They'll be more dyspneic, just like a heart failure patient would. Um, they're not going to have fever with this. So you just have to be aware, and um, most times a cardiologist will screen them with imaging and pulmonary function testing. And so here's a patient who's had on, on the bottom who had been on uh, amiodarone. The first x-ray shows very subtle interstitial changes, but not really that much, not that remarkable, but go forward three years and you can see now the patient has extensive interstitial um, and fibrosis which on CT scan, again, this is an early version, just a haziness, it would be very difficult to pick this out from someone with heart failure alone. You'd have to do a good history and physical exam, probably te ancillary testing. And then here, but this is end-stage fibrosis from amiodarone. And unfortunately, a lot of this will be irreversible at this point. So you need to look, get, get an evaluation early, not late. 
because you, once you have fibrosis, it's not going to get that much better. Another ground glass mimicker. So again, we talked about edema showing ground glass changes or this haziness, if you like. Um, this is, but it also ground glass can be, there's a broad differential for that, including inflammation of various and different kinds. Um, this is just a case of strong alloides hyperinfection. I saw this past year here in, in uh, Charleston. Um, again, nothing special about strong alloides for this finding. It's just showing you that you need to have a uh, index of suspicion in this patient had a history of, heart, of COPD and congestive heart failure, but this wasn't heart failure and this wasn't COPD exacerbation. This was strong alloides and uh, hyperinfection syndrome, a rare cause, but many other types of inflammation can do something very similar. So septal lines, the curly lines we talked about, okay, very common in heart failure, but there is a mimicker too to this, um, and that is lymphangenic cancer. And so in this case, uh, the, the cancer is spreading in the lymphatics, and these lines, these septal lines, you can see everywhere, they're forming these polyhedrons. Uh, they're not as smooth as in the heart failure, and they're lumpy bumpy because there's tumor cells moving through these. Uh, this is the primary tumor you can see on this cut, but you can't see it on this cut over here. But this is a mimicker of septal line thickening, something to always think about if other things don't check out. Bronchial cuffing, which we talked about, the airway wall thickening. Uh, again, there's a differential for that as well. And here, uh, bronchopneumonia can do that. This is a case of H. Haemophilus influenza pneumonia. And it, again, on, in the yellow circle, you can see this bronchial wall thickening. The, those walls are very thick. In this case, they're not due to edema fluid per se. It's due to pneumonia inflammation. And you have these areas out from the lung that show uh, what we would call tree and bud. And what that means is that in springtime, you see how the tree buds out from the stems before you have big leaves. That's what that's supposed to mimic. And I think it does do a good job here, if you think about that. Anyway, that means that you have infection running down the bronchial walls. But again, just looking at one item, just the bronchial wall thickening and looking at nothing else, you know, you'd say, well, could that be that? But the tree and bud stuff uh, directs you elsewhere. So a couple slides about heart failure phenotype and therapeutic approach, and then we'll be done. So the two uh, cardinal symptoms of heart failure are dyspnea or shortness of breath that relates to pulmonary edema because of high pressure within the lung. The second common symptom is fatigue, and that relates to a low cardiac output. So there are two symptoms, often going hand in hand, but not always. So if you have dyspnea and edema, you usually have crackles on exam, you'll have abnormal chest x-ray or CT scan. The primary problem should be addressed with diuresis. On this little diagram over here, which I took from the Journal of American Medical Association, uh, it shows congestion at rest across the top, perfusion on, on the vertical axis. Uh, it's just a four, two by two table, four boxes. Uh, whether the patient is warm and dry, this no and no means they're fairly doing fairly well. Yes means their volume is up, so they have um, pulmonary edema. Those are the patients who need to diurese. Uh, these are the patients that have um, poor cardiac output because their heart's just not squeezing well, et cetera. You can go through that if you wish. But the main issue with, with edema is diuresis. And then after load reduction, like a vasodilator may be helpful. Now, these patients that are having pulmonary edema will wheeze sometimes. Remember, we said that a significant portion of these patients will mimic asthma, will have wheezing, coughing, nocturnal symptomatology. Um, you can add a beta agonist for them, but the real primary thing is getting their vascular pressures, because if you get their vascular pressures, you get the, the pulmonary edema taken care of, the bronchial wall thickening taken care of, the wheezing and the respiratory symptoms will go away. Um, so that's really the thing to think about. Uh, but if you wish to go more into this little table, it is instructive, I think. The last slide I have here is cardiorenal syndrome. And the only reason I point this out is um, a lot of patients who have heart failure who come into the hospital from de decompensated heart failure, we call that acute decompensated heart failure, um, will have this because their diuretics are no longer working well. And that's, uh, that's a problem. That is a real problem. And it signifies advanced heart failure. So it, it's diuretic unresponsiveness. And the thing to, to note about that is these are the patients that need to have intravenous uh, diuresis 
Um, and there's there's reasons for that. And these slides, this slide shows you those reasons. In other words, what's happened is they're, um, for whatever reason, their kidneys are no longer responding to the oral dose of diuretics. And so uh, furosemide, which is the commonest used diuretic, um, has some significant limitations in absorption. And um, as you can see here on the uh, panel B, uh, the diuretic concentration is on the y-axis time on the x. You have to get above the dotted line to get any response in diuresis. And that's a healthy person in you know, the, the gray line, dotted line. Uh, when you go into decompensated heart failure, your threshold for response goes up there. And the way the absorption of the Lasix goes, again, you notice in the oral line that you don't get much at all because you don't get above the diuresis. The intravenous route gives you a uh, significant time. And if you see the area under that curve above the, the line, that's the time you're going to get the diuresis. And that's why you admit these patients to the hospital for IV diuresis. And we do that a lot here. And in summary, that's the chicken heart story from Fat Albert and the Cosby Kids circa 1972, my childhood. Um, don't fear the heart too much, though. So we talked about thoracic manifestations of the heart and um, things to recognize and a few uh, items about therapy. And that's all I have today. I'll be happy to answer any questions. I just wanted to say excellent job. Thank you so much for doing that presentation. It's very thorough, informative, and including some case examples. Does anybody have any comments or questions? Well, it was a it was a joy to be here. Thank, Thank you for you. having me. Of course. Thank you so much. If you do have any questions in the future, please just shoot them our way and we can get them to Dr. Moorhead. Really appreciate your time. I just have one announcement and our next session will be November 7th with Sarah um, Haddock discussing causes and management of plural effusions. So thank you so much, everyone. You have a wonderful week. Bye.